So, uh, a little bit on the practical version. To recap then, the GlamWiki toolset is intended to use it, primarily use it intended as in partnership with a library archive museum. So, um, and it's intended for batch uploads, really large uploads. If you want to upload 10 very carefully selected uh, photographs from a museum, don't use the batch upload set, the tool. It doesn't help you. That use case is not what the tool was designed for. The tool is more designed for if you want to upload 100,000 images from a uh, large museum or a thousand images. Exactly where the cutoff point uh, is depends on case by case. But for example, for 10, don't bother. For a thousand, um, it can be practical. So Jesse, I think the sound and vision upload was about 2,000 uh, images. Uh, so yeah. Total, uh, yeah. So in a scenario like that, having the tool simplified things. Okay. If, he, if Jesse had wanted to upload 15 uh, audio files from sound and vision, it would have been easier to do them one by one by the regular uh, upload tool in Wikimedia Commons. So, but to keep things simple, I'm gonna do a very small data set here. I'm gonna upload 28 images from Rijksmuseum to uh, Wikimedia Beta Commons. Um, this is to keep things simple because this is a demo. But as I said, if I, if I really wanted to upload 28, I probably would have done them manually. Uh, but if I wanted to, what we did uh, with this tool, we upload all of the Japanese art from Rijksmuseum to Glamwiki Toolset. That was about four or 5,000 objects. Then the tool um, is valuable to you. And I'm starting, uh, right now I'm starting here from Europeana because that's where I'm used to seeing things since I work for Europeana. Uh, when you're doing an upload, like Liam said, the first thing you do is not just jump into the tool. The first thing you do is think about what is the goal of this upload? Why am I doing this? Um, what's, the, uh, what's the goal? Should, is, it, is the goal to upload loads and loads of stuff? Or is it to upload slightly smaller amounts of stuff that you then uh, carefully curate and add to Wikipedia articles and so on? So basically, before doing a batch upload, have a plan. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind when you're doing this kind of upload is uh, the tool will help you to scale your upload to large amounts of data. That does not mean that the tool can automatically do everything for you. Um, it cannot, for example, automatically translate the way the Rijksmuseum structure their data to the way Wikimedia Commons structures their data. That's what you, the GlamWiki tool uh, uploader, need to do. Um, and that's a cognitive exercise. It's, it's an intellectual exercise. Uh, the tool can simplify it, but can't do it for you. There are a couple of other things that the tool can't do either. For example, the tool will check if there is a Creative Commons license or a public domain mark uh, in, in the uh, data being uploaded. But it can't check whether it's the correct value. So for example, if if the Rijksmuseum have added the public domain mark to uh, an object that is not in the public domain, that's not something the tool can automatically check. It can only check whether the public domain mark is applied with the correct URL to the public domain mark. So there are things that you need to keep in mind um, uh, yourself when you're doing the upload. Um, another reason I often start out here is because I want to take a look at the data before I, this is part of the planning. What's, what does the data look like? Okay, so I can see here that the Rijksmuseum, I want to upload all of these in rows as they're called. Uh, an in row is, uh, in Japan, people didn't have pockets. Instead, they had this little tiny uh, box called an in row that hang from their belt, which you could open, and there you could put your coins and other small stuff as you carried it around. Uh, these often became very highly decorated, as in having very uh, uh, rich decoration. Uh, this is actually quite a simple one. Uh, here's a more fancy one, for example. Um, so I look here as well on this data. So typically I can see that the Rijksmuseum, they tend to always have a description, most often in Dutch. Uh, they tend to list who created it. Um, they tend to 
at least provide a date for the century. Uh, they always state that this is Japan and they always state that it's an in-row. So I need to look at what the original metadata, how it is structured. And this will vary from library to archive to museum, from archive to archive, from museum to museum. Uh, and this is part of the preparation. This is part of the intellectual exercise. Uh, and this is why, in many cases, it's best to do an upload like this in partnership with someone from the GLAM who knows their collection. So if they're not comfortable uh, wrangling XML metadata um, um, themselves, that might be what the uh, Wikipedian in residence might be comfortable with and can help out with. So this is why it helps to be in partnership. So why would you then go through this? Well, the alternative is, of course, if I want to upload those, these 28 at a time, I would do them manually one by one in the Wikimedia Commons one by one image upload. And then I would have to manually copy and paste this into each individual object. If I wanted the metadata to be as rich in Wikimedia Commons as it is in the Rijksmuseum system. Um, so, um, what the tool helps you to do is instead of doing all of this copying and pasting, um, it allows you to make one mapping. So, you can make a mapping that, oh, I'm going to use the artwork template of Wikimedia Commons. How many here knows the artwork template of Wikimedia Commons? Uh, how many of you knows that Wikimedia Commons has something called templates? Okay. So, a template is, well, basically what it says, it's a template. The artwork template says, structures things and says that, uh, that you can assign an artwork a name, you can assign it a creator, you can assign it a period, a description, and so on. Kind of like this. So, what the tool allows you to do is to say that description, I will map to description, creator, I will map to artist, and so on. And then you can apply that mapping to 28 items, is the way I'm going to do in this exercise, or to 28,000, or to 280,000. It doesn't really matter. So the point of the tool is really to scale. That's why it's, uh, it was uh, about batch upload. Um, so I've done a little bit of mental preparation here. Um, I want to get this out in XML. Now, a big museum like Rijksmuseum, they they can produce XML themselves. Uh, but if you wanted to do this with a smaller museum, they might not, uh, or they could have a hard time doing it. It would be a big exercise for them. For smaller museums who are members or libraries or archives, shouldn't just be about museums, uh, we are developing some tool support. So if they're already in the Europeana, you can, you can, we can help them create an XML uh, export, for example. Um, so this is uh, a tool in development that we're doing right now, which you can see by the completely uh, unaliased uh, URL there. But it's functional already, basically. Yes. Uh, not ready to share with the world yet, but this is one way for us to, to help our partners. We can, of course, only export XML for people who are European partners. We can't do it for uh, the Museum of Minneapolis, because they're not European partners. Um, yeah. Who can I contact if I want to have an XML uh, export? <laughs> is it you actually? Well, um, the idea is that we're going to put this tool, once it's uh, ready to share with the world, it's in internal testing now, on European Labs. Uh -huh. And then you can just use it uh, yourself. Do you have any time frame for that? Uh, no. Maybe it was a mistake showing this. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it is. So. So the tool works this way. Here you can see that, uh, let's go back to where you saw all of them. I'll have that URL. Yeah, here I made this query. And what, how the tool works is that I copy this query part and I put it in here where it says Europeana query. And then I put in my email address and then I execute the query. And then a background process starts to create this XML. And when it's done, I get this, you can see now you're seeing straight into my email box, but who cares? It's mostly work anyway. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So when this export is ready, uh, it mails me and I get a link. So, but I pre-cooked this in advance, so I've exported these 28 in rows from the Rijksmuseum. I don't know if this is what I'm 
all time, but um, I don't know so much about software. I think XML is yeah. a kind of mark -up, up language which brings the, the format of how I put information into a file. So if you talk about the XML, you mean a file in which you have XML code, and with this code you are structuring the actual data in yes. this file. Yeah. And an XML file, this would be a very large file with ten thousands of it's as, it can be as large as it needs to be. For so, example, so right now, for example, right now, file for everything. Yeah. yes. Okay. So here's the XML file for these 28 Rijksmuseum objects. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 The data, yes. yeah. So the, the, the data in these XMLs that are exported through Europeana, they come from the Rijksmuseum website. No, these ones come from uh, these ones. This one comes from the metadata Rijksmuseum has provided to us. So it's the yeah, yeah. It's a simplified EDM model, um, which is a little bit flattened and simplified. But this is what a, what an XML file looks like. Um, it's not intended to be user friendly. It's XML is intended to allow you to shift data from one software to another software, which is basically what we're doing now. We're taking data out of Europeana. We want to put it into Wikimedia Commons. Um, and like I said, to keep things simple, I did 28 here, so it's quite, uh, it's not very many. Um, but you can do, the size of the XML file can, can vary. Um, how did you do that? How I did it? Yes, how is this produced, this XML file? It's an output. It's an output from the Europeana database. And you have a certain program that is doing that for you? Yes, the one I just showed, the one. Save as HTML, save as JSON, okay. save as okay. text. Yeah. In principle, it's a query uh, exported this in XML file. Yeah. But for libraries, if they have a, a content management system like Adlib or something, that will normally have a function to, to export an XML. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no particular advantage to XML over any other kind of HTML or. Oh, there is. Well, <laughs> XML is about structuring data. HTML is about how to show things on a website. There's a difference. Or, um, my point is that yeah. it's versatile. I mean, you could write out all of that information in a, in a Word document, mm. uh, but that's hard to then yeah. put into. This will work for, if not the, the most... Uh, library specific or museum specific but it will work for any kind of input and export to any kind of output so it can be used for anything yeah so a lot of um, a lot of softwares that are used in the glam sector actually a lot of any kind of database software uh, supports output in xml format because it's a very common way of exchanging data uh, and that's why we chose xml as the format that you feed into the glam wiki tool tool um, so this is what it looks like, looks very raw. Um, the other part of planning here is that um, um, here, um, if, I would, if I was to do this upload for real, so to speak, uh, at this point I would uh, do a lot more looking into this XML file and perhaps doing some uh, uh, manipulation of the X file to make it uh, a little bit closer to the way commons structures things even before I do the upload. Um, for example, here is where I would, um, here I'm keeping, I keep things easy in a way here because these are all type in row. And I happen to know that there is already a Wikimedia Commons category called in row. So I said that Wikimedia Commons only accept categories in English, but certain proper nouns like in row, for example, are supported. Uh, so I don't have to do the kind of language to, lang to English, original language to English translation here. But otherwise that would, might be something that I would uh, do some data wrangling on. Um, another thing that you can see here in the outputted metadata is that, um, and you can see, well you can actually, so here is for example a description of uh, an object. I don't know how many of you read Dutch, some of you do. Uh, I don't read Dutch very well either. But it says, um, uh, box of golden lacquer consisting of five parts, I think. <laughs> and, but what you can see here, yeah. Uh, uh, you will find this 
just as a description. It's not a description that it is uh, uh, in Dutch language. Exactly, that was what I was going to point out. So one of the things that I would do here in the metadata wrangling stage is that I would add language tags, yes. especially to descriptions. Yes. Um, and in this case, I, would do that, uh, I wouldn't do that one by one. Part of the metadata wrangling is trying to automate things. So I would probably do a search and, re search and, re search and replace. Uh, search for DC description, replace with DC description, lang equals nl. And, and update everything. So these are, but I won't go through these steps now. What I can say is that when you do a batch upload, this part of prepping the data takes a lot more time than the actual upload yourself. Planning your upload project takes a lot more time than doing the upload itself. And typically it also pays off in terms of the quality of your, up, your upload. So you can upload 300,000 images that you've sort of, in a sloppy way, um, and that's a little bit why the tool is uh, quite controlled uh, in how you get access to it. Um, 300,000 photographs with descriptions not in English, yeah. no language tag, no categories. One category that says uploaded by yeah. X museum. Yeah not useful to anyone. Yeah. yeah. So that's why uh, a, a lot more goes into the preparation than to the actual execution. Um, what I don't understand is, yes. uh, this is, this is, I think this is, a, this is the main problem, and this is the main, the most important thing to do during this, uh, uh, this process. Yeah. yeah is this, this file. Yes. Yeah. Don't we have a tool uh, to... Uh, <laughs> that, that's but that's, uh, what, I was, to, that's to, what I was saying. The yeah, this is not a tool. This is a text, I have no problem to work with a text, uh, with a text editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and search and replace and everything. Yeah. It's pretty easy. But, but usually some people do have problems with this. Why don't we have a tool to, uh, to, to, to try to, um, to do it really as it's seen on commons? That's... So the... For making a pretty easy put your data here, that's what the upload wizard is for. That's the standard Wikimedia Commons. I have five pictures. I will give them all a description, give them all a title. Once we start talking about mass, you have to automate it. And that means you cannot avoid dealing with metadata. There is no magic solution to working with metadata, converting from one system to another system. If you can be sure that every single time you are dealing with a structured, standardized uh, vocabulary that is using the same words in the same style, perfect. We can make, we don't have to do any of this. But because every single database, every single archive uses a different language and coding language, and export system, and tags, and uh, quality of the data, and definition for date, year, month, day, day, month, year. The tool, by definition, then also has to accept all sorts of different inputs. Um, the more versatile the input, the less standardization you can force on people inside the system. Yeah, I don't know if that explains it, but the, 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 there are lots of generic metadata wrangling tools out there, um, XML Spy, certain stuff you can do d directly in Notepad. Um, so d developing one within Wikimedia Commons, a piece of software, at least we at Europeana would not be willing to do it because it's a never-ending job. Um, the rules, if I were to clean up this XML data set, I would base a couple of rules and, I would, and it would work here for Rijksmuseum. And then uh, when I made an XML export from the uh, uh, Museum of uh, Altorkunde in Heidelberg, they would structure their XML data differently and I would have to start over all over again. So it's very, so the metadata wrangling part is the most difficult part. There are certain recipes out there, uh, for example, Hey Cronin uh, created a metadata wrangling tool for the data from the National Archives here, actually. But a lot of those rules only apply to the way the National Archive does their XML. So this is, it's a very difficult problem to solve with software, where you can only click a button and get, and get things done. 
But if you want to do uh, XML metadata wrangling, there are, there are different tools that you can do it. Or you actually need to be a developer. If you want to transform the metadata in a, in a massive way, then you probably need to create a, a script to do it. Um, yeah. One of the first questions to ask about the, the, the gland, once they've agreed to do an upload, yeah. is whether they've got somebody who can through these tailored versions of the XML file. Because the ones that have gone best in the UK have been where we've got an expert at the gland who has done a series yeah. of XML versions until we've got one yeah. that works for the yeah. Or you have a Wikipedia volunteer who can do the same. So um, certain uh, uploaders like um, uh, Ashley from, from Wikimedia UK, Faye, he's very good at metadata wrangling. So he spends quite a lot of time doing that before he sets off one of his ma massive uploads. So he doesn't do enough on categories? He doesn't do enough on, enough on categories? No. Categories is, is, a, is, the most, is, a, is a really difficult part because uh, if you hear, hear things are fairly easy, when I do this upload, I'm more likely to create the category in row from the Rijksmuseum, which is quite straightforward, and I can do it automatically because every object here says in row. So I'm lucky in that way. But for other types of metadata, especially if it comes in and not in English, then you have to put a lot of effort into, um, uh, into doing it. I, I uploaded uh, a Swedish data set to, to Commons. And I think the mapping took one hour, but I spent one day just creating a sort of basically a, a translation file between their classification system with Swedish values into what the closest existing commons category was. Um, so that's, it's, it's a real yeah. With yeah. It has been for some years, especially actually Dutch uploads, I think. Yeah. But they go in at too high a category level, and you suddenly get a, a category that I'm preparing an upload from Europeana from our crowdsource collection of 1914-1918. So World War One stuff. World category World War One is relevant, but not sufficient. Yeah, and it, it swamps the category. Yeah. You know? I mean, also one of the big Amsterdam churches, I think the West Cape or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you've got 400 black and white photographs of rotting timbers from a restoration project in the 1960s, and they happen to have a low alphabetic. Uh, prefix. So if you go to that category, you get 400 photos, black and white photos of bits of rotting timber, uh, and then you have to scroll through three common screens before you get to the modern color photos of what the place looks like. Inside this is now. why access to the powerful tool is a little bit controlled. Yeah. And this is also where you should you have to think about the, the goal of your upload. I mean, duplicating everything that you have collected on Commons doesn't make sense. Want their current people using it? Um, well, you um, may do, but you should put it in a, in a you know, you should create, be ready to create yeah. lots of subcategories yeah. that hide the stuff. Yeah, it's a bit of skill. Yeah, another way is yeah, is to do some preparation with your community, and so so that they're forewarned in a way. And you've recruited a couple of volunteers, who, once you've uploaded these five thousand images, they're sort of ready to start using the hotcat and whatever the other tools that are developed just to help out in categorization and go through it. Make a little project out of it. Have a categorization-a-thon or, or I mean, something. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably uh, uh, the better way to, to split all these XML files. Yeah? If you, That's if why I did that in a way, by searching for in rows only. I, think, I cannot imagine that you make 100 pictures with one XML file and everything is perfect. I, don't, I can't believe it. But I think if you can split it, with, with, especially with this, with this 28, yeah? yeah, this was a special query, and you can you can uh, you can say this is exactly this, That's and one, then you one make one doing it is XML file after the other, and it's better to make 10 with 28 or 10 with 50 than one with 500 yeah. or something. I think it uh, varies between uh, between the nature of what you're uploading, but I also typically. Uh, lean towards that, that uh, rather than doing one humongous upload, uh, I, I might do a little bit of a split and do a series of individually smaller uploads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's, uh, it also makes the consequences if something goes wrong smaller.
so it's a risk minimization thing. Should I move on? Uh, can you see things? I can barely uh, see things on my screen. So once you've logged into, uh, once you have access to the to the uh, tool set on Wikimedia Commons, as you can see here now, I'm in beta. You can see that on the URL there. And actually, there's a little beta icon there in the logo. I didn't notice that until now. Um, this is your first screen. So Liam also mentioned that since we're pulling in images directly from a library or archive or museum, you also have to what is called whitelist their image server. Uh, this is because Wikimedia Foundation only accepts direct import from select uh, internet domains, um, not from uh, just anywhere. Uh, in this case, I've actually uploaded Rijksmuseum stuff before, so at some point you will see them here. Do you see my cursor? Yeah, so this is already whitelisted. Uh, here begins sort of the metadata mapping part. Um, in my XML file, all the individual records are contained within something called DC. Uh, that might be something you will encounter if you do uh, data from a library or archive or museum. DC stands for doubling core, which is a very common standard for how to represent library, archive, and museum data. And in this case, all of these objects or in DC and DC. Basically what I'm doing now is I'm telling the tool where to look for information about in each individual object. Here is also where I select the commons template I want to map the, the, this Europeana data to, so the target template. Um, these are standard templates. You can also create your own completely custom template in Wikimedia Commons and then uh, reference that one here. Um, I won't do that right now. I'll just choose artwork. If you have made mappings from the Rijksmuseum before, you can reuse that mapping rather than start from scratch. That's uh, why you would use your example of 12 groups with one small with it different topic each time. Yeah. So I would just point to the previous one that I had used yeah. before, adjust something, and send it Save it under a new name, yeah. Uh, here is also where if we do put in place a couple of default Europeana to commons um, mappings, you could reference them here and, and pull them in if you want to. Right now I'll, I'll start from scratch because I want to show you how this is done. And then I upload my file. Um, here is my XML export, the same you've seen in Notepad. Uh, and let's submit. Feel a little bit nervous about doing this live. Uh, it seems to work. And a little bit annoying since the screen has this resolution is that uh, if the screen had a little bit more resolution, actually, the metadata you see here would be to the right of, of these fields, so it's easier. Uh, let's see, yeah, here, there we go. So, thank you. So this is actually the target template. So this is what the artwork template in Commons allows you to fill in. Accession number, artist, author, credit line, date, etc., etc. And here is a record in this, uh, among these in rows, the first example, the first example uh, how things are shaped in Europeana. And this is what we call mapping, because what I'm going to start doing now is to, for example, say that, hmm, they have something called artist, but in Europeana we don't have anything called artist, so what is the closest thing to artist in Europeana? Well, looks like, whoops, if you scroll down. Creator. It is creator, but let's see here. Scroll. Ah, uh, here. Wait, 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 wait. Scroll up. <laughs> uh, it is creator, uh, but Rijksmuseum is a little bit more advanced than many other uh, museums. So um, it is actually this one: enrichment agent label. Uh, if you scroll up again, you will see that the DC creator value here is just a code. This is actually because Rijksmuseum does a little bit uh, what Wikidata does. Uh, 
instead of uh, calling this person by their name, they give them a code so that you can have the name in various different languages. Um, so, so, but to make things easier, we've also spelt out uh, the label here in the metadata. So you saw what Liam did was that he opened this dropdown and shows enrichment agent label. The, this series are the same as here. Is why we chose in the previous screen DC DC. The, the, the software, the tool knows what are the labels to look for and lists them, and then you can match them together. This is the, the first uh, record in the XML. Isn't yeah. It? And this is the yeah. first example. Yeah. yeah. So this is a little bit, if I, again, so I'm fairly familiar with your Reich's Museum data since I've done an upload before, but this is uh, uh, the, prep, the preparation part. Uh, if I were doing a completely fresh upload from a system I didn't know, and I didn't have anyone from that museum to advise me, I would do a lot of just paper, present, paper prep, looking at a lot of how they structure their data and sort of do uh, my own prep, because that would pay off in the end. Yes. So this is, for example, um, um, if you go down here to title, uh, uh, if you choose DC title here, now you did type, sorry. <laughs> uh, click the uh, green one, and then choose DC identifier. A little bit up. There we go. So, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's you can do yeah. it yourself. So, in a way, uh, yeah. So, in a way, that's what I've done now. Uh, the title, the target field title in Commons template will now be filled in by two values title identifier, which will then be put together. Uh, I think they will be. In a, regular, in a regular field, I think they will be semicolon separate. I don't actually know, but it should be, I, I can't remember straight off. We'll notice when you upload. This is, concatenation is especially important for the, uh, the name of the commons file. Uh, for those of you who are used to commons, you know that the URL is commonswikimedia.org slash, and then a, a and then the file name. And that file name has to be unique. So you can't just upload 100 things and just call them all in row, for example. Um, so here is where you do the most thinking about concatenation. So typically with a, um, a museum like Rijksmuseum, that's why I use DC identifier here, they have a unique code for each individual object. And typically, they also have a more human-friendly title, DC title. So for example, for Rijksmuseum, I would recommend combining the human-readable title with a code, uh, with an identifier, to build up the commons uh, file name. That could be one way to ensure um, that the files are uniquely named. Um, I also see a couple of other uploaders. They typically put the name of the GLAM into the file itself as well, so that each each file becomes Rijksmuseum underscore inro underscore one, two, three. So uh, different uh, philosophies on how to build them up. How the important thing is must be unique. How it resolves the conflict? If, if it's not unique, it will be blocked from the upload. And the upload will continue? Yes. It will jump, uh, it will jump the uh, non-unique object. And how can I get this list? How can I? Uh, I am uploading maybe 100 items, yeah. and um, there are conflicts in 10 items. Yeah. So I want to get the number of those 10 items. I'm is not sure. I uh, think so, because you, there is a log uh, created from the upload where you would uh, find those. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but typically, if you do use a, a local unique identifier, uh, it, and if you and if you if you build up your title wisely, uh, it's a fairly low chance uh, that you'll be uh, uh, I'm not uploading something unique. I'm going to, if there is a conflict, then how can I resolve? So that is the question. So yeah. when if, when I'm going to upload some images, then I will 
make sure that it will not create any conflict. Yeah. But if it creates a conflict, just there should be any ways to resolve it. Well, one of the ways to resolve you then you, you need to, one of the things that you can do, if you don't have any way to, in a structured way, resolve, uh, resolve the conflict, then you have to go in and edit the XML yourself. Um, no. Or find a different way to compose your title. No, what I'm saying that uh, I started the upload. Yeah. It, it has maybe 100 images. Yeah. And after the finish, I found that there is only 90 images uploaded. Yeah. There is 10 is missing. Yeah. So I want to know which 10 has missing. Yes. And I want to re-upload those again. Yes. So that's from the log file. The, the list of which 10 weren't uploaded, you will get to the log file. And then it depends on the reason why your uh, file name wasn't unique. You have to look at them and figure out why weren't these unique. If you can, if and then modify your mapping. Which are the ones that are missing. Okay, then fine. Yeah. If, if broke, uh, and it might, there might be many reasons why that file did not succeed. Non-unique non file name, the images already on Wikimedia Commons. Um, okay. Does, does Peter... It doesn't check in advance this file is already on Commons, but Commons will reject yeah. as a matter of principle, not, not just for this, but for anything, if the exact same JPEG at the exact same resolution is already there, it will just reject it. How do I know? Image recognition? Uh, there is as well, but that's not, that, that's not the file name, that's the nature of the image itself. It will check that as well, but that's the... Yeah. to, for example, to the title, add some custom text. Now, there's, there's a field Rijksmuseum, but if there was no field Rijksmuseum, would it be possible to just add the Rijksmuseum by hand? Not by hand here, no. So uh, that's that's what you would do. Every that's what you would do with uh, in the, in your data prep. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's not so. It's not. It could be an intelligent way to do it here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just add a little yeah. dash or something simple. Yeah. That was one of the other things that were, it was in our list of things we would uh, like to do for the yeah. version two. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, this process generally for a new, if you've never used the tool before and you're using it for a new institution, you will probably go through this two or three or four times, each time saving your mapping, making a, a draft, making an example, seeing something didn't work, going back to the mapping, uploading what you did, and changing something, save, test, a bit better, back, save, test, until you are happy. Can you save this work here yes. as a template yes. Yes. for the next uh, uploading yes, process exactly. in the same institution? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Because this is the most work, this is the most exactly. important work so, here. At the, very, at the very bottom, save mapping. <laughs> and that creates a subpage of your user page wow. on beta, user David Husky at slash whatever you yeah. call it. Uh, when you go to Commons Normal, that's that's the information you take and put into Commons. You, you're building actually a JSON file. You can you, copy this. You page. copy that mm -hmm. when you when you're happy. Put it on Normal Commons. Yeah. yeah. And then you can retrieve it and change it a bit. Yeah. 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 You can make version, version one, version two. But most of the work really has been done. If, if it's the same institution, yeah. You yeah, can yeah. come back and yeah. Yeah. it's like your 12 sub uploads. You just change one piece. Wow. All these elements in, the, in this template, are they mandatory? Mm. Uh, not all. The ones with a wild card. So basically just uh, very little. And that's the uh, Wikimedia Commons way in a way. That's not uh, something that the tool decides. It's just that the template... Uh, that's the way Wikimedia Commons work. You can upload an image to Wikimedia Commons and the only thing you have to make sure is that the, uh, the res resulting URL to the image is unique. That's actually the one mandatory thing of a uh, Commons image upload. So, uh, but you can see here, I, I quickly, I've done uploads here from before, so I've, I've created some of the um, mappings. So, 
dimensions, for example, in Europeana terms, that's often called, or rather than doubling core terms, DC terms extend. Object history, so the history of the object as a collected item is what many museums call provenance. So I've mapped provenance. Permission in commons is the right statement, so that something is creative commons or public domain. In Europeana terms, that's called Europeana rights, so I mapped that field. Place of creation, I did DC term spatial. Why did I do that? Because if you look here, that's where it says Japan. Um, so that's how I mapped that one. For me, this, is, this part is now quite quick because I've done Rijksmuseum before. Uh, typically, your first, I think there's sort of a curve like this. Your first upload will take uh, what I would say normal time times 10. Your second, you will do twice as fast, times five, and then it will go down. Once you've done a half a dozen, this part becomes very easy. This is the easy part. The difficult part is the wrangling. Until you discover that there are actually new possibilities, like in, in, uh, including templates, yeah. including custom fields. Yes. So this is the thing. If you really, the, but this is a choice in a way. I chose uh, an existing standard template. Uh, if you really want to do loads and loads of work, you can create a custom template uh, and, and reference that one. Yeah. You can create your test custom templates to make it possible to put it in the normal template. And that would be the more preferable yeah, way yeah. to do it. Well, yeah, so you it could make like the another preferable. version of the artwork template. Yeah. Yeah. So the custom template would create it as an artwork template. No, but you, you have to give it another so name. That would be possible. You have to give it your own name, obviously. But you can grab the artwork template and then add fields to that as many as you like. Like by doing some creating your own. What did you say? Uh, I said, um, so you can, you can make your own custom template, uh, but it's very wise to start with an already existing template and, and just add or yeah, rather not take away fields, but add fields that you feel you need to uh, allow your metadata to land. Um, the only thing is that with a custom template in the future, if we go to more structured data on, uh, with maybe on support for the data and uh, we can leave about this metadata. That's going to be really challenging to uh, to do that with custom yeah. templates. Is there a way to extend the existing template? For example, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in our country, there are some special information we store for our libraries and museums, so which is not available in the general template. So what can I do on that case? Um, yeah, you then you create a custom template. I, I can and he says not to do that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would disagree you, with him, because not I, I would say you can... You can create a custom template which uses actually the artwork template. <coughs> Quite complicated, but uh, so that it would be able to map it later on. If you're at the level of being able to make your own custom templates yeah. and knowing then how you to interact will. with the artwork template, then you probably don't need to use the Glamity toolset. You can do your own mass upload using scripts and bots mm -hmm. and fancy things. Um, but it is true. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Uh, Liam. Yeah, Liam, for the, the drop-down menu at the very start where you choose your template, there is only a limited amount of templates that are suggested there. Would that list, list ever be expanded? Um, there's no technical reason why it can't be expanded to have a larger number of um, example uh, suggested most likely templates. Yeah. But they are the most likely templates that GLANs use. And under custom template, insert your own template. You could point to one of the other existing it doesn't have to be your own. It's just, here are the most likely six. Pick another one if you want, uh, which can pre-exist or make your own. Okay. Um, I've done some uh, quick and dirty mapping here. Let me just uh, save that as well. At, at the very last field, the URL of the media file. Yeah. So it says that the file should be somewhere other place. Yeah, and this is, that, this is where I tell this is where I tell the tool where to pick up the media file. If the library or the institute don't have any uh, digital archive publicly accessible, yeah. So what should, should then uh, then you need to uh, then you need to improvise. Um, one way of doing it is that you could um, take if they had, if they have local 
you yeah. get a hard disk from them instead. Um, one way of doing it is to upload all of those images to Dropbox and then use the Dropbox URLs. Um, the tool requires an online image. Um, that's a constraint of the tool uh, at the level where we left off its development. Um, but the Dropbox address URL will not be accepted, I think. It's just a whitelisted. If it's whitelisted. Yeah. Because, uh, Who can uh, Amazon list? Uh, um, a, uh, a commons administrator. Okay. Uh, Amazon uh, uh, SSS was not accepted uh, a year ago. I don't know. Yeah. I've, 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 uploaded, I've uploaded images from Amazon, so. Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, it was not. Uh, not I don't know. Uh, I've uploaded ones for, uh, that are sourced from uh, an Amazon, for example. They are, I don't know, uh, this, is, this is beyond me. I, I'm a Europeana guy, I'm not a Wikimedia Commons guy, so I don't know what the rules are for what they whitelist or not. Um, but I can, I can say that I have uploaded stuff that have been stored on, on Amazon. Um, otherwise it has to be mounted on some other disk that has uh, the ability to create a URL uh, for, each, for each file. Yeah, okay. Uh, David. Yes. Can I point out one detail that might be helpful? The, can you go back to the 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 or uh, at the bottom there at the uh, WG toolset title? Yeah. You see three fields. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's not the order that the title will be necessarily built in, because it will take the order in the, in the XML. Yeah, which is annoying. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a while to figure that out. Yeah. You can change them. Yeah. Change in the XML. You have to change yeah. them in the XML. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Um, who can I see? Saving the mapping to be able to be reused later. Point. So this is just going to create a sub page of his user page with that name. Data. But this mapping, while I created this mapping, it is available on Commons in and of itself, and any other Commons user can use it. So it's not private to me. Um, So data here, um, lots of different uh, options here, and I've confused myself here because I can never remember if uh, the Japanese do first name first, last name first, so I'll just leave that one for now. Normally I would look that up on Wikipedia. Um, they do. <laughs> this section at the bottom now is material or metadata that is applicable to the entire upload. Yeah. So you can wrap your description field in a language template. So if, there's, if you know that every description is in Dutch, but there's no record item in your, in your metadata that says language equals Dutch, just click language template, yeah. and it will, it will put it all under a, the category uh, Dutch description. You can add categories to the entire upload. In the individual items, you have specific categories, but here you would say multimedia uploaded by this museum, your tracking category. Uh, so this is, the, this is the section of generic metadata that you add to the whole link. The, the institution segment, this material was uploaded by in partnership with, it goes on every single file. I'll do a very simple uh, here. The only thing I clicked in, uh, clicked in is to attempt to detect the license. Uh, Rijksmuseum uh, for each object very explicitly says that it's public domain. So I've been able to map this. This might not be the case for many archives and museums. In, in those cases, what you can do instead is to apply a global license. It doesn't say so in the metadata, but you have been discussing with the Museum of X, and they say you can upload all our stuff on, under CC BY, for example, and that's what you do here. Uh, I also created one global category in row in the Rijksmuseum just to apply for everything. Um, this is a demo. Uh, I would have probably tried to put some, a little bit more thought into the categorization otherwise. Uh, you can also assign a partner template. I actually don't think there is one, and I won't do it right now. Um, Rex Museum. Yeah, so this is, if you want to, 
combine a phrase that you enter with a value in the uh, in the metadata. Um, uh, for example, so I did category intro in the Rijksmuseum like this now, uh, since I could actually have done it like this, in row in the, and then put in what is called Europeana data provider. That would build up the same phrase, in row in the Rijksmuseum. So this is a way to combine a phrase with values in the metadata. Uh, one way of doing this is, so I made a search here, so there's only in row in here. But imagine that I had a data set where there were a number of different types of Japanese artwork. Uh, then I would, then I would uh, try to build up a categorization that uh, has a parameter in it. Um, uh, yeah, DC type in Rijksmuseum or something like this. Uh, now I'll empty this one out, otherwise we're going to get it twice, I think. Global category for each 12 batch being different, or one batch, 12 item by item category. The outcome is the same, but this tool gives you the option of doing it either way. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I hope I haven't been logged out in the, in the uh, once I've been doing the mapping. I'll now to do a preview batch. Uh, what the preview does is that it takes, see? Huh. See, this is the uh, danger of doing things. Uh, it's a learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> we are very familiar with this. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. Let's try it again. I guess it's the second time it might work in my experience. Oh, yeah. Is it that? Three it shouldn't be. Yeah, I think the problem here is more that actually it says not found. <laughs> yeah, but they're all the same, I think. Yeah. See, this is uh, the dangers of doing a demo without having actually gone through it before. This is very odd. Yeah. Is show net, doesn't that work? No, that's uh, a link to the sort of HTML page of the Rijksmuseum. So it won't work. Uh, bloody hell. You can brown the address not found just put dot jpg at the end of that url so that mm -hmm. don't think so This one certainly works. It uh, looks as I've encountered uh, one file that in particular, and I think I know why now. <laughs> um, I think this is the one that I'm having a problem with. Um, so what I would have to do here is, let me just, yeah, if you have one that works, and I'll fix this one. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it's perfect, but I just want to see what this one is called. 149975. David, you have 25 minutes until the coffee break, you know that, right? Nope. <laughs> but uh, thanks for notifying me. Yeah. Mine yeah. Yeah.
Now Jesse is going to show how it's really done. Okay. If only to prove it to myself, I've removed that offending uh, one in row that actually didn't have an image. Uh, they're now being uploaded to the Commons beta, one by one. You can see them here. Uh, and this is what it would look like uploaded. Um, here I bypassed the preview and did this upload to, just to show you how it, would do, how it would be done. But I can tell you that if uh, I wouldn't have actually pressed the upload button here because I'm not happy with my mapping. Um, the file names are horrible. Um, there's other stuff that I, that I wouldn't like here. So I would sort of typically, it's a rare occasion indeed where you do a perfect first mapping. That's why you have the preview function. Uh, go through a couple of iterations. It's rare to get it right on the first time. This is always, the, as in with everything in life, practice makes perfect. So prepare and iterate. Uh, don't start the upload until you're, you're happy with things. So there are things I don't like. I don't like the file name. Here I can see as well that uh, when the Rijksmuseum don't uh, know who the creator is, they put in anonym, which means anonymous or unknown. Um, that doesn't really help anyone on Commons. I would likely do some uh, wrangling beforehand and, and remove that, or at least I would. I actually don't know what the Commons policy is on, on how to signify that uh, something is uh, unknown. Put their unknown in English. Put unknown so in English. Yeah. Yeah. Put yeah. Unknown yeah. Adding yeah. Something unknown. like that. Yeah. So I would at least do a search and replace and, and exchange anonym with unknown, for example. And um, you have that in the but yeah. the actual file name, you want to have a few meaningful words yeah. and something that makes them unique and maybe something else. Yeah. So, right, so here, for example, one of the things I don't like here, so um, uh, in row with bridge, in row with bridge, Rijks Museum, that's nice. I would probably try to do some wrangling here. Uh, perf this, this, this URL is unique. It works, but I find it inelegant. <laughs> so I would, I would do some, uh, some uh, work here to try to get it more elegant. I would try to get uh, artist unknowns uh, in. Um, I would actually bother to do the uh, lookup of what, what are the Japanese name conventions. Um, as in, should I, let's see, maybe I think number three here actually had a name. And it's worth pointing out that it's not just a question of, of, of elegance. So yeah. You want, presumably, you want your images to be used and yeah. to be used in preference to yeah. other people's ones. Yeah. So if you've got a meaningful name yeah. that's got in row quite close to the front, it's more likely to come higher up in people's yeah. search. Yeah, it's true. And here, well, here it was easy. This, this Japanese guy only calls himself Shokasai, so I don't have to figure out whether that's his first name or last name. But I would, I would do... Uh, I, this is what the preview function is for. Uh, the preview function would show me very clearly, in this case, that, David, you haven't done enough prep here. You haven't uh, prepped the metadata well enough to, to continue this batch upload. So I'll go back to the drawing board and do some more prep and return later, reuse the same file. Until I got it, well, perfect is a big word. Uh, perfect is the kind of thing that stops you from doing anything because very rarely things are perfect. Uh, but I would like to set a fairly high standard on good enough, especially, so here it's 28 items. I could always edit them afterwards. But if, let's say I was prepping here a batch upload of 300,000 images from Library of Congress, I would damn well make sure that I'd done my metadata wrangling before pressing the batch upload button. So, um, there are a couple of things here that has worked well. Uh, we can see that the current location has correctly picked up the Rijksmuseum. We can see on permission here that, uh, that uh, the public domain mark has been picked up correctly, etc. So there are things that have gone right, but there are other things that I don't like and I would return uh, to the drawing board um, and pick up things. Um, this though is of course beta commons. So, 
I would always make a full sort of general rehearsal on beta commons before and when I'm happy with things, the way things look in beta commons, I've done my metadata wrangling, I've done my homework, then I would switch over to the real Wikimedia commons and basically just repeat. Uh, yeah, I mean, in my case, I already have permission. So if you don't have permission on, on real commons, you need to apply for it. Uh, but the point, uh, but the point is, the point is, do a general rehearsal before you do the big show on Wikimedia Commons. So you have to do one upload to beta mm -hmm. and then another upload to real commons. Yeah. You don't transfer the beta you one. You, you can. Uh, what I would do here is that I would also, I would move over my mapping file. That's the first thing I would do when I switch to real commons. Right. And I would, of course, use my wrangled metadata, not my pre-wrangled metadata. Like no, probably not. Yeah, three. probably not through all 300,000. But the, uh, the whole process up until then, yeah, it doesn't make sense to put 300,000 on beta. Not, no, indeed. Um, here, for example, the 28. 28, that's fine, no one cares, but uh, this is indeed the case. Yeah. Yeah, this is the thing. Uh, if I come back here in a month, I'm not sure these 28 would be here anymore because uh, I think they clean up the beta commons now and then. In so, in summary, uh, the tool works best at, at large scale. The tool can help you overcome the problem of scale. It cannot think for you, and it cannot uh, automatically turn badly structured metadata into well-structured metadata. The thinking and the metadata wrangling is the task of a human. The, what the tool saves you is that if you're uploading 50,000 uh, images to commons, is that you don't have to type in the metadata one by one by one by one by one. So that's really what the tool helps with. Uh, it is also designed to work fairly well with the way most libraries, archives, and museums structure their metadata. Uh, and that's also what it helps you with. So it's not really intended for you to use if you've taken 5,000 images yourself. Uh, in that case, in all likelihood, if you want them on Commons, better to go to Flickr first and then perhaps use the Flickr Ripper uh, or use the uh, wizard uh, upload. So it's really for GLAM metadata, large scale. Um, best used in partnership with a GLAM and in partnership with your local chapter or a group of volunteers who are willing to uh, do some post-upload cleanup or inclusion of uh, uploaded images in the articles that are suitable uh, suitable for it. Any further questions? Like I said as well, the first upload, that's the worst one. Yeah. <laughs> um, then, uh, then things uh, get, e get easier. It's like everything in life. But the first upload with Upload Wizard is for everyone the worst one. Yeah, it could be. I've, I've, only used the upload wizard once, and it was a long time ago. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay.